We are Squawking Dead, a podcast pulverizing episodes of the Walking Dead universe. Sometimes we give you news, sometimes we make you laugh, but most times we go deep. And today, I'm your host. Today, not maybe today, tomorrow I might not be, your host David Cameo. <laughs> and I'm joined by Survivors Tier members Bridget, X Prophecy Girl on Twitter, and Jasmine.iac on Instagram. First off, we want to let you know that we are going to be at Fandemic. We're going to have a table where we get to talk to all of you, give out free stickers, to sh- shake hands as normal people do as we're moving in that direction. Maskless, I think, because Fandemic has not really made it very clear that masks are going to be gone, generally speaking, at Fandemic, although it still says it on the website. Although John, the guy that runs Fandemic, had said in a public live stream that masks were not going to be necessary or mandated during the convention. Anyway, because we have press credentials, we'll be interviewing, uh, hopefully, Walking Dead cast as well as vendors at the convention, people who, of influence, let's say, who've brightened our community and have been, you know, people you look up to in the community, people whom you follow. So we'll be interviewing some of them for our TW Family Branches segment. So fingers crossed on that too. We'll be filming panels as well as filming you. Right now we have a video out that is asking you, and we'll be putting it in the both the description of this video and also the blog, with a link where you can record what you're l- looking forward to most at Fandemic. We want to know. And why, too. It's not enough to know what you're looking forward to, but we want to know why and what it means to you as well. Click that link, record a video. Try to be like less than a minute long. We're going to be including it in a compilation video with your answers, weaved in and out between other answers. A uh, short little video, hopefully, and be kind of a cool way of generating a little bit of excitement. We've already had a bunch of people like Bridget, Jen Wakely, obviously the people on our team, Cosmo09, Rachel Bird, Sharon DK, Blazy Gardner, Elisa Jones, survivor, another Survivor Tier men, member. This is just to say that the second half of that compilation is going to be, what does The Walking Dead mean to you? We'll be talking to you at our table, hopefully getting you to tell us what The Walking Dead universe means to you, how you got into it, more like what about it has changed your life, really. Whether you've just hopped on or been part of it for the last 10 years plus, uh, we want to know. So come see us at Fandemic, give us your story, and uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of content for you afterwards that we'll be spreading out the course of many months, because that's just the reality we live in. But I also wanted to say another thing I haven't forgotten. I have to say, Ryan, at RealRyanGM on Twitter, but he has been a source of much anxiety, (laughs) but these are good problems to have. To explain, Ryan has been a pitch hitter when it comes to funding the podcast. It started from when we were running our Jackbox Games charity live stream, which you can watch if you want to watch all seven hours. But we we did to help out a fellow TWD family member who we were just trying to help get money for her to fix her roof. Ryan saw this and donated a bunch to us directly, which we promptly got rid of because we just sent it to Vanessa, who was the TWD family member who needed help. But then he just kept throwing money at us. And I just wanted to say in as few words as possible, but most effective words as possible, our appreciation for him funding the podcast so that people know I made sure that our funding goal at ko-fi.com slash squawking dead reflected all the money that did not go to the charity. So that in mind, for the most part, he managed to bump our goal up to 80%. Now that goal started at the beginning of November and the goal is to be self-sufficient. So all the static recurring expenses that we incur throughout the year, I've tallied it all up and the goal is to get to 100% before next November. It looks like we're well on track for that, which means we get to update our goal at some point. And what that's going to be, I have no idea, but once we hit self-sufficiency, we're gonna have to rethink how we view funding, at least for the goals. Ryan, thank you, just thank you. Your support means a lot to us. It makes us want to do more, makes us want to do better. And just a little shout out for you at the top because you've been amazing. And you have no idea the panic you've induced uh, behind the scenes in our Discord. And if you joined our Discord, you'd find out, you son of a bitch. Because <laughs> we're constantly praising you in there. I don't know. That's the best we can do in terms of our gratitude. Like berate you for making us happy. Yeah, that's how we do it here. Before we continue with this episode breakdown, I wanted to say if you have any questions for the following proposed people we're planning on interview at, interviewing at Fandemic, those people are possibly, but not guaranteed, Norman Reedus, Michael James Shaw, Seth Gilliam, Kaylee Fleming, Austin Emilio, Alexa Mansour, 
Cooper Andrews, Michael Cudlitz, Cassidy McClincy, or Christine Evangelista, please submit them through any means possible. You can submit them in the comments of our YouTube videos. You can submit them in our Discord on Kofi at ko-fi.com slash squawkingda. You can DM us. You can DM us on social media. Our DMs are wide open. But you can also email us at info at squawkingdead.com and we'll take your interview questions and uh, we'll just throw them away. I like your t-shirt, Bridget. Oh, yeah, thanks. Since we finally saw it. No Luke, though. Uh, yeah, where the fuck is Luke? Let's describe what we were talking about. Like in this episode, we do see Oceanside and Bridget is wearing a t-shirt. I'm sorry. An Oceanside t-shirt. It wasn't very helpful to those listening. So today we're talk- We're going to talk about The Walking Dead's 12th episode of season 11 titled The Lucky Ones. And it's never been a more apparent than this episode because interwoven with every set of people that we're following, it seems apparent that like, what what is luck? Is it something we make? Is it something we're born with? Is it something we foster? Or does it even exist at all? I enjoyed this episode mostly because I hated Maggie in 11A. Because she came back and she was so, like, different and just annoying and solely full focused on, like, the Reapers. And I don't know, there was just something about her general, like, persona that was quite irritating in 11A. Whereas, like, one, in episode nine, she was fire. Like, that was sick. But two... In this episode, like, I found myself kind of siding with her in a way. And I did like the way that she, like, carefully weighed things up. And that she's not just, like, going with the trend like everybody else. But in reality, I think if I was in Maggie's shoes, I probably wouldn't have made the same decision of her. So I find it really admirable that she did make that decision. Or that she had, she felt like she had the strength to make, to go against the trend. Yeah, so, yeah, it was really interesting. And then I also loved that Eugene got, like, a little bit of happiness. Uh, so that was another uh, highlight for me. <laughs> Lastly, I just really loved every like scene with Mercer and Daryl. It was so nice to see them like kind of becoming friends and just interacting and in Daryl and Mercer's kinds of ways of becoming friends. It's a work know. in progress. <laughs> what did you think of this episode? Well, I mean, maybe to frame it also, was it nearly as frustrating as the last one? No, no, not at all. I mean, it had its little moments of like, was that there but it was a it was a really great episode i really enjoyed it i enjoyed being able to see the communities again um to see some people we hadn't seen in a long time like diane which was exciting and oceanside it was exciting to see people at oceanside because every time we've seen it recently it's been like barren i got some insight into pamela i feel like that i really wasn't expecting um and that was nice so my opinion on lance as a slimy weasel stands. Two episodes prior, when we kind of got a sense of, I think it was New Haunts. Did yeah, I did felt that? Bad for him. In that episode. Yeah, yeah. And now I, reg- I regret it. Regret <laughs> never, it I'll never feel bad for him again. <laughs> hmm. Okay, but okay, you got to. You... I'm not gonna say that out loud because I'm gonna like totally eat crow about that later. I'm sure. I'm still very intrigued by that. So I haven't, I haven't formed any conclusive opinions for or against him. He's quite an interesting character. Well, I'll say for as as wormy as I think he is, he does make for interesting television. I have the same feelings as Jasmine on that one. I It's hard to make up my mind about him considering everything that we've seen. Because on the one hand, even he reflects a lot of what everybody is kind of, from Carol to Maggie to Pamela to, to even Daryl, when they're trying to describe how it is we've made it this long. Take, for example, Maggie illustrating, I once had a lucky rabbit's foot, but, you know, my dog also dragged it in whole, basically. So what is luck, right? What is Lance, if not manifesting just what hard luck and dedication can bring you? Like he, he's talking about his, his, his imitation gold lucky coin, right? That his dad gave him. But what is that if not a nickel wrapped in gold plating or not even, maybe even, but like, cause the inside is worth nothing. You came from nothing. But if you manifest it, it can be that lucky coin. It can look like at least what you can become. This thing is otherwise worthless, but like, if you believe in it enough, it is what you believe it is. So like, that's why I haven't made my mind up about him. It's like, he's not espousing anything that is inherently bad. Ambition alone, to me, isn't a bad thing. Sometimes it's just what you have to do to achieve that ambition. And that maybe is what we might see from him later. But again, I'm not sold yet. So Even did, with what did happened, did you see last the uh, the coin that he had as a metaphor for Lance or as a metaphor for the Commonwealth? 
Maybe a little bit of both. I mean, and things can often and do often have du dual meanings. The gold plating is what you see on the surface, but once you're inside, you, you, you kind of get to scratch a bit beneath the surface and see what it's really like. But then does it also like a reflection of like Lance's dual personality? Oh, okay. Okay. So like a triple meaning. <laughs> I can't make up my mind about Lance just yet because I go back and forth on like, is what he's trying to do inherently wrong? And like with all the hard work that he's made for the Commonwealth, I, I feel like he's the kind of person who's put in so much to keep this thing running. And Pamela, I think, knows that. Like, that's what's expected of you. So obviously, it's kind of like when Chris Rock said, oh, you're actually there for your kids. What do you want a cookie? Like to like fathers who stay around for their kids. What do you want a cookie? That's what you're supposed to do. So like when Pan Pamela Milton says that about Lance, it's like, that's your job. You're supposed to do all this stuff. I'm supposed to sit here and run the whole thing. And you're supposed to actually run the whole, run the whole thing. You're supposed to do all the things I plan, guy. So I'm, I'm still kind of sympathetic a little bit for him in a way. When I was on the Dave Reacts episode, you had said like, what is he trying to hypnotize her? And I had written that in my notes because he was like flipping the coin like really steadily. And the, uh, the score behind it was like a very hypnotizing melody. And he was talking like so smooth and like, I don't know, something about it just like gave me like a really weird vibe. It was just kind of creeped up. And I looked into like, like, I was like, I feel like there's something in the world about like the devil and a coin. Okay. Like, so I had to like look into it. There is, there's a, a magic trick having to do with the devil's coin, but there's also a probability problem called the devil's coin flip. Suppose the devil has a weighted coin that comes up head 60% of the time and tails 40% of the time. And the coin is flipped over and over until the game ends. Every time the coin comes up heads, you give the devil, you know, whatever. His due. And it, yeah. <laughs> and every time the coin flips up tails, the devil gives you whatever the agreed upon arrangement is. The devil starts with, so let's say it's dollars. So he starts with $10. You can start with however much money you want. Would you take his bet based on those probabilities? Like on that probability of like 60%. Right. 40%. The answer was that no matter how much money you start with, it's always a losing bet. Right. Which is why it's the devil's coin flip because it's you're never going to be able to win. I just thought it was interesting imagery that I had like automatically connected to him. Like <laughs> he had done mm. nothing wrong in that situation, but I just felt like something so strongly was like just in the negative that I was like, ugh, it's like the, like the devil with the coin right now. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but that was, it is a thing, so... And maybe it does illustrate a little bit like that no matter what Maggie chooses, even if it means safety, if it, even if it means a relative amount of comfort, am I losing? What what am I losing? What's the cost, essentially? Yeah. And is it is it too high? That's a good question. I'm going to be absent for the next 10 minutes. I'm going to solve the problem. Let's move on to Maggie and the cost, because kind of like what Diane says, like, OK, throughout this whole episode, Maggie is flanked by people whom she loves, whom are constantly saying this makes things a whole lot easier. Instead of starting and stopping, rebuilding the hilltop, wondering where our next meal is going to be, holding up the the chickens that she and Pamela Milton catch while hunting, uh, saying this is more food than we have in weeks. Three chickens? In weeks? Okay. And the sandwich. And, uh, you know, I don't trust them, but we're just going with the flow, kind of like what Rosita says to Eugene earlier on. On the one hand, she's like seeing everybody benefiting or having an easier life or and maybe building on this. Why, why do you think she makes the decision to not join the Commonwealth? Ultimately, I, I know Angela King says something about that. But what do you think? Because she's taking she's taking our jobs. It's like in that moment, she's deciding, right? That's kind of like the vibe I got was in that moment where she's like, looking on both sides, like the troopers and yeah, the medics. Like that's where I felt right? like she was like really making the decision. She looked over at Daryl, who looks normal because as Mercer said, it was someone's decision that you could dress this way to keep up appearances for like optics. So she sees Daryl doing what Daryl does, you know, helping clear stuff out, like just getting the dirty work done. And Mercer, you know, calls all his men to pull in line. Formation, and he doesn't. Right? He's still doing what he what he would normally be doing. And then I love that Mercer is like, we're always watching, like, please come on, because I like Fall in line. I don't want to get I don't want you to get in trouble. And I think just to see Daryl, this person who's like always like in solitary, despite his connections to others in the group, he has always been a loner. He has always gone off on his own, hunting, 
and doing whatever. Like that's, that's always been his thing. So to see him fall in line for this, for people that are not his own people, just like, it that just kind of, I know you were Maggie's talking heart. about like his, like his like little strut thing that he was doing as he was walking. Yeah. But to me, it looked like sad. Like it made me so sad. Oh, that he really? was falling okay. in line. Yeah, it like killed me because I was like, that's not Daryl. Like he's doing this because he like really loves Judith and, and RJ and he wants to keep them safe. And he like in this moment, he thinks this is like the best way that I can do that. But I just hate that he like has given up part of himself in order right. to do that. He's, You're fa- he's sacrificing, sacrificing a little bit of individ- individuality, essentially. Yeah. And so I think Maggie seeing that, I think that was kind of enough for her like to see that but then also to look over to the other side and see that the troops are then coming up to pamela and she's like the one giving orders i think she was just like that's it i'm done i'm done this is too much of a cost is to have to take orders from you like we've done this on our own we've established these communities on our own like we've done the work maintaining them and fighting for them and having our people die for them and i don't want to just pass it over well, well, there's a whole other side of that that we need to discuss, though, too. And part of the reason why I think she makes that decision, in spite of every single person she cares about saying this has made our lives better, is something that we can't forget, which is when she comes in Tennessee, describes the horrific stories that she and Herschel experienced on the road. She and Herschel. Reminder. Even Daryl says that's a different kind of kid. He was he grew up on the road. Uh, the Farrells, the Reapers, what Maggie had to do to end them, mostly, basically, all of them. That is her experience. Her communities that she tried to establish with with, jo- with Georgie and without them, having them always fall, she actually kind of touches on that a little bit in this episode. I don't know what makes one community lucky to, to survive, because I've only experienced two, <laughs> or three, rather, with Oceanside. Even the Saviors fell, right? So I think it's not enough I don't think she even trusts that the, the Commonwealth could survive, even though they have stood the test of time, the, the test of time, perhaps even longer than Alexandria has in some senses. Because Pamela touches on the fact that, oh, wait, it fell? How many times did it fall? Commonwealth hasn't fallen once. I'm not used to this sensation. So, Which is to say, like, okay, I, I think maybe she's like, oh, they're long overdue for falling. You know, this whole falling in line thing. But uh, yeah, I just, I just see her as being a cynic. I just see a person who's been burned too many times but doesn't that, I wonder if she's just being stubborn though, too. No, but regardless, like if that was her thoughts on it, wouldn't you want to accept help in the short term to allow you to rebuild? I right. think I think it's more, uh, it is more about like kind of what she said of like, like, I know this is going to cost me something down the line. And it's also like, why does the Commonwealth want to help? Because if you think about it. You know, like Pamela even said it herself, like they're, they're burning resources. Like, what do they truly have to gain from helping these communities that are so far away? Even if they want to rebuild the world, like that's always going to be a slow process and using up so many resources just to get that started. But doesn't that show how dedicated they are to restoring the world? The fact that they're expending their resources, even Pamela Milton explains at the beginning with Lance in the caravan, that this isn't something I really want to do because, you know, like Napoleon and Alexander the Great before him, their their downfall, the fall of Rome, they spread themselves too thin, Napoleon, they spread the empire too thin, all the way to Syria, where my ancestors came from. She's like talking to Lance, who is clearly a bit of a slimy guy, and thinking, am I even being told the truth? Do they really want to rebuild the world? What is What is their ulterior motive? Because does Lance want to rebuild the world? Is that his own goal? No, he's doing it for himself. What about Pamela? Pamela doesn't even want to be there. In the end scene, she kind of, in a way, sort of does not dismiss him as she did with the wine in New Haunts. She says, in effect, I got to credit you. You know, you really, you really stepped up with this one, in a sense. Even though it didn't work out the way you wanted to, I admired your effort. Kind of, did you get that sense from her on this one? She was very impressed with the communities that he brought her to. I think she right. just thought like he's full of it like this isn't going to be anything different than anything we've already seen and obviously it was because she was shocked that they had rebuilt several times that that there were three freestanding communities that were able to work with each other and build themselves back up etc cetera, etc cetera. i think this opened her eyes in some sense do you think lance failed not in what he's trying to do i mean he's gonna still stick with this like he's not giving up on this idea and he got her to relent so like did he really lose in any way 
I don't think so. No, I, I think it's subjective though, right? Because I think Lance might might have thought that he had failed and he's turning failure into an opportunity, right? I mean, any Fortune 500 company will tell you failure is always an opportunity. We don't stop at failure. Like, not like most of us. We fail and then we like eat ice cream and then <laughs> die a little. But like, you know, most of those people just, they stuff that shit down and they, they keep going and they turn failure into opportunity. They lose money and money. They lose, they don't get to, depre- well, they do, but like they don't tell you about it. And then they keep going. Like if you want to be successful, you have to not give up. I see that in Lance. This is how most things go. You're trying to shoot for a goal. Even this podcast, we have we have goals. We shoot for the moon and then all of a sudden we settle at a different place. But you can't call all your endeavors a failure if you didn't get exactly what you wanted from when you set out. Sometimes you fall short of that goal. She even said you were reaching by trying to reach out to three communities. Like kudos. But I, I actually genuinely think that he opened, his pursuit opened her eyes to the possibility. And that can't be a failure. I mean, if you've moved somebody ideologically in a different place from where she was at the beginning of the episode, I think that's a huge accomplishment. And I think he sees that in a sense. I think he was a little frustrated by the end when he's shooting all those walkers at that last scene. And as creepy as that was, I honestly believe it when he says, Aaron, I'm feeling A+. Because as frustrated as he is, I think he does recognize that he has moved her some. And that is not the norm for him. He's usually pretty dismissed, even though he does a lot for the Commonwealth. Well, cheers to Josh Hamilton, because he looked bat shit crazy in that last scene. He looked insane. Which is kind of like a weird divergence from the comic book, in a sense, right? Because I wish we could check in with Rachel (laughs) and say, do you still think he's a big dum-dum? Or does he even compare still to his comic book counterpart, who is this unaware dum-dum? It seems like this guy is comfortable out in the wild. He's seems confident enough to be able to handle himself too. I don't think he's stupid. I think he, he is definitely very smart and he's nothing like his comic book counterpart. Bridget and I don't know, so that's why I'm checking in with you. Can we backpedal a second to a line that was said in the tent by Pamela to Lance? You have been ambitious our whole lives. They've known each other at the very minimum a long time. I would almost say like sibling, but they don't necessarily behave like that. So like maybe like cousins. I'm not quite sure. Not even. I I, I think his family or at least him was part of her father's team, her PR, Mm. her PR team, her father's PR team, maybe it seems like, or at least like some sort of campaign, campaign ad agency or something like that. It like led me to believe that they'd grown up together or like kind of come up together like in some way. Yeah, there's a little bit of that illusion in how she regards Deanna Monroe, who makes an appearance, or at least a a kind of callback, because she wasn't even like, and this is kind of drop a note, she wasn't in politics at the time at all. She was in philanthropy along with her, you know, probably to dovetail with her father's work in politics. So she handled that, but and she probably she crossed paths with Deanna Monroe in that circuit. So it seems like Lance had been involved possibly in her father's campaign or some some sort of pre-apocalypse fashion. Moving on to Lance again, though, out in the wild, A+. plus Imagery, that shot, the shot to the head with a revi- revolver, the shot to the head with a shotgun by Pamela was shot in the same way, where it was like behind Front the facing? walker head. Yeah. Oh, nice catch. As Daryl is giving Maggie the candy that Judith bothered to get Herschel, and making the horse meat joke, like, oh, next time you eat horse meat, have Herschel have some of this candy that Judith gave him, brought for him. I think that was a little interesting reminder, which kind of dovetails with this idea of maybe Lance didn't succeed in what he was trying to do. I think he is breaking even. I think Pamela is even moved by his ambition and that the door is open. Just like that, you know, Daryl says, like, even though I'm with them, I'm still with you, you know, and the door doesn't have to be closed. Like, even though you don't want to go with them today, the door is always open. Like, let's, let's think incrementally, even though you don't want to join them today you, and you don't have to, like, I'm still going to be where I'm at. I'm still going to be thinking of you. People out there in the Commonwealth are going to be thinking of all our family out here. I like that because a lot of people, when they decide not to go with something, there's always the impression that like, oh, I guess I can never ask them again. Like, well, no, I mean, the door is always open. Compromise is possible. We can still share some things, you know, even though we don't have an official agreement. We're still out here. We still exist. I saw those two scenes with Pamela and Lance and then also with Maggie and Daryl. It's kind of a mirror there. And that, okay, maybe this didn't work out quite the way we wanted to or 
as intended, but the door is still open. There's still communication that's possible, which gave me a little bit of hope. You know the, the devil's problem? I set it up as an algebra uh, algebraic problem, and then I did some integration and some other random shit. And I think that there is a possibility that it can be solved, and you're not 100% doomed. However, you only have an approximately 2% chance of winning. Of, of actually making money off of that bargain. Well, of not dying, because the whole thing oh. about, I think the whole the whole thing about the devil's problem is like, if you if you run out of money, then you die. Um, if the devil runs out of money, then, uh, then you, you win. Then you win. So you can never win, right? But you can you have a 2% chance of not dying, <laughs> essentially, is what you're saying. No, 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 you, you've got a 2% chance of winning. Oh, of actually beating the devil. Of beating the devil, yeah. The devil's problem is not impossible. There is a 2% chance that Maggie will succeed. But it's effectively impossible. I mean, think about it. This is not conducive of like the attitudes of people who have like, let's say gambling addiction, right? Maggie herself has tried to bring up tons of communities only for them to keep falling. And now that somebody's coming in that's offering her a ripcord for all this nonsense, she's not going to she's not going to take that. To me, there is a frustrating aspect to it. Like I respect her decision too, in as much as it's one that she makes for herself. But as the people peel off around her, and like even Lydia is saying this, I love this part, but even Lydia is saying, when is it okay to give up? I love how Lance actually overhears her in that instance and says, hey, uh, Maggie, uh, we got some supplies here, uh, some extra supplies. You think you want some of that? And like, he hears this and he's like, let's just, let's sweeten the pot. Let's make this a little harder for Lydia. Hey there, Sharon. Hey. I get here and everybody leaves. That, that sounds people about right. That's <laughs> So, okay, with all the people telling her around her as they're walking through this episode, side, flanking her side by side, you know, oh, we should, you know, we should consider it. Things are getting better. You know, we don't have to do starts and stops. We, we can actually, Lydia, we can actually get sleep. Like, you're not getting sleep? What the? And then she decides for herself. I see, I, I don't know necessarily if she's deciding for herself or if she start, she's deciding for her community not to go with this deal. As she tells Pamela throughout this episode, I lead by example, I lead by my actions. I, we all decide together, kind of like Rick, as a group, you know, we're all equals. Even Daryl reflects this in his conversation with Mercer. You know, we, we all kind of ran the place. Maggie unilaterally makes the decision to not join the Commonwealth, even though there are people around her, even Lydia, who decides to stay with her, that it would be better. Keep in mind that she unilaterally made a decision. Is she wrong? Because everybody in the history of society, including the Commonwealth, has to sacrifice some individuality in order to get what they want, ultimately. As, it, as an individual, we all sacrifice little bits of ourselves in order to ultimately get what we want. Is that not true? I mean, case in point, having to give something up for what you want. Look at our poor spouses. But, but, <laughs> right. <laughs> case right, in point right, right there. Right. Now so this is all going to stay we, in. What we've established is that you guys are all selfish except me. Wait, what do you yeah, mean? Yet, Jasmine. Yet. <laughs> yet. Yeah. Give it time. Yeah. Give it time, you you're, piece of you're shit. You're young. <laughs> I also want to point out the age, the age gap between all of us too. Yeah, you're still you're That'll still change. in the taking they'll, they'll always be the same age gap. That won't change. <laughs> no, I mean, but you'll be you'll be yeah. our age one day, yeah. and you'll understand. God, I sound so old. I sound like my mom. That's disgusting. Look what you You're making me do, Jasmine. Look what look what you made me you do, me Jasmine. Sound like my look mother. At, <laughs> Violence. Uh, what? You'll understand right. when you're yeah. older. Now I get oh, it, Mom. God. I don't want you to be right. Because <laughs> he's older than you. Yeah. yeah, he's older than me. So. <laughs> Sharon, you'll understand when she's my age. Uh. Anyway, he tries to tell me that all the smarter. time, but yeah. I don't believe it. <laughs> I think we've all illustrated that Maggie is making this this decision, but it's a gut check like sort of decision. Like she's seeing all the benefits and seeing the one thing, which okay, it's hard to disagree with her because The Walking Dead it brings out the person you were meant to be, right? Do we want to lose? And like it's emblematic of this is this being the final season. The Walking Dead was always supposed to be, okay, now we're seeing all these satellite UFOs of people who are trying to be the version they were meant to be colliding with one another. Obviously, there's conflicts and the ultimate libertarian's wet dream, like everybody having ultimate freedom and everybody ultimately crashing into one another, right? Okay, but now we're at the stage where it seems like that formula 
if we want what we want ultimately for our children, is that the formula we want to raise our children or the raise the future in? Okay, we have friends and children to consider. Do we want things that the way they were? It's hard to argue with her because we, as P- as watchers of The Walking Dead, appreciate the fact that Daryl could be who he, he he ends up being in the apocalypse, as opposed to being like this white trash nobody pre-apocalypse doing harm on other people because that's how he was raised. But, but do we do we think that that Daryl is happy though in the Commonwealth? He seems to be. I agree, and in fact, even Rosita says the Commonwealth has made it possible that I could be a cop. Who would have seen that coming? And I'm kind of good at it. So who's to say that the Commonwealth isn't that second stage of evolution in, in the Walking Dead universe? Like, okay, the, the Walking Dead universe, as I entered it, made it so that I could be the person I was meant to be. But what if now being a part of the Commonwealth universe, let's say, even though the Commonwealth universe can change, and we've seen Mercer lapsing a bit when he sees what Daryl has to say about, oh, what were you before? But like, well, I was nothing, but now I'm something. Well, that's possible. Yeah, it's possible in The Walking Dead. What, you, you didn't experience that? But then Rosita having this second evolution. And even Eugene saying, well, yeah, you could be whatever you want to be. You've always been good at everything. But the Commonwealth gave you that. If not for the Commonwealth, you wouldn't have been that. And could have this life with Coco. I suppose this can only really be applied to Commonwealth soldiers because everyone else is forced into their pre-apocalypse rules. Right, the troopers being the, the, the ex- escape hatch for yeah, that tro- class. Troop- right. Troopers are the exception, not the rule. But they're cleverly designed. As a stage, uh, sorry, as a class. Did you guys catch what she said during that conversation, though? She alluded to it being temporary, which is also what Kelly and Connie alluded to in their conversation, that they have made this decision temporarily, like they're all planning on going back. So sure, it's fine for now, like I'll fall in the line and be a cop and and I'm good at it and no big deal because it's not forever. I can I can have my freedom back if I if I so choose is what they think right now. What do you make of that? Well, I don't know that that's true. I don't know if that's an illusion, like that they could just walk out and leave. Is this like Woodbury? Yeah, you can leave whenever you want. Then every time Michonne tries to leave, like it just seems like there's someone in the way. But wait, like it's like it's like getting pop ups, like advertising pop ups. But you can't leave just yet. (laughs) Here's a 35 percent off deal on your next part. Whatever. That's Woodbury. Well, maybe this does dovetail onto Maggie's experience. Maggie's like the extreme of that. It's like, well, I'm not going to even bother entering into this deal because there is a cost period. Never mind the fact that it, it could help you achieve so much more than you ever thought possible. It's something that you actually said to Lance. I wanted to build it. I had the, I had a key to the future, which he, which is alluded to. Like, oh, Aaron alludes to this. He says, well, we don't, we don't have engineers, but Maggie from Hilltop had all the design plans, a key to the future, or the key to the future, or something like that. I wanted to build it, she says, but I just, I just couldn't. I didn't have the resources. We kept getting attacked and shit. <laughs> My communities kept falling and shit. Now here comes this possibility and she just denies it. I just see it as, as foolhardy. To go back to what we were saying about Rosita saying it was temporary, Connie Kelly saying it was temporary. I, I think that's all guided by experience. Every time we try to do something, some, the whole place falls or really, something comes along to make the walls fall. Something, a, a whisper of war happens and hilltops basically burn to a crisp. So... Of course they think this is temporary. Oh, this place is, of course, is not going to work out for us. It eventually will fall too, or just our dumb luck. But, but they give it a go. They kind of allude to that they're waiting for Alexandria to be like fixed again. Like once it's back to normal, we'll just go back. That's the irony too, right? They use this as a hub to go back to Alex because Alexandria has shown time and time again that it can be rebuilt. It always real, yeah. It always comes back. It's like the husband that keeps leaving you. (laughs) He always comes back. What if he doesn't come back? What if it can't come back without the Commonwealth? What if that next thing demolishes it to a core? I mean, look at our Fear of the Walking Dead characters. Like, we concluded from our fear coverage that is a safe place possible. And a nuclear bomb goes off and we're like, nope. (laughs) Nope. Not really. Sorry. And now we're entertaining the possibility that the Commonwealth has the means, is the end game, let's say even, for the Walking Dead universe. And, and by that, we don't mean by that it is the Walking Dead's end. It was like no reason to tell the story if the Commonwealth is the foundation upon which we can rebuild humanity. Let's, maybe that's a good question. Do you think that it, that's the case? No, because there's always going to be another enemy. The CRM. There's always something bigger. There's always, there's always something to fight. But how about after that? What, after do, the does, CRM wipes out the Commonwealth? Does the Civic Republic, in some form or fashion, let's say they went out, is, is that the foundation upon which the the world coming back is built. So there, like you said, yes, there is always an enemy, let's say, just for the sake of simplicity. But at some point, the, the Walking Dead has to have an endgame, maybe. 
And maybe the end game is stability, is a foundation, is society rebuilding itself in whom, who's at whomever's image. Could be the Commonwealth, could be the CRM, but that's where the story ends, technically, really. I feel like Pamela was right when she said 50 million little communities fighting amongst themselves is Alexander never going to build anything. Yep. Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, it, it's never it's never going to. It, all they're going to do is fight amongst themselves. But this until implies they wipe something. What do you think she was implying there? That you have to be part of something bigger or it's not you're not going to grow. And so I'll ask you the question I asked just earlier. So even though Lance sort of fails in his project, did he fail completely? Did he not move her to open her eyes, at least to the possibility that we can absorb other smaller communities? But I don't think she's really into it. I'm sure she sees the benefit of bringing another group like Alexandria in because it's more people and people are a resource. But I don't think she's that into it. Like, I don't think that's her... She, because even she says it, she's like, ah, we got so much to do here. We don't need to worry about all these little, you know, scattered places. But in terms of trying to bring Maggie in, she did try to, to talk Maggie into it, kind of. So, I mean, yes, I guess she wants them in to come in, but I don't think that's like her main goal. I, I do feel like Lance did move her in that direction, though. Like, oh, if we get these kinds of people, then maybe we could do a lot more than we set out to do from the beginning. Of all the leaders Maggie mentioned, Deanna, Georgie, she did not mention Rick. Why do you think that is? From. People in the... Uh, uh, yeah, she, yeah, Jasmine. Because she's still salty at Rick because of Negan. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. Was that better? It's like she hates she's me. just <laughs> adding ASMR to this podcast to ensure more porno? viewers, Dave. That's all Sorry. she's doing. We, we don't have an account on OnlyFans. I mean, we should now put the unedited episodes. <laughs> OnlyFans. <laughs> OnlyStands. <laughs> all right, let's get that domain name. OnlyStands.com slash Squawking Dead. I'm not just uh, the president. I'm a client. <laughs> my wife and I were making jokes about, hey, honey, would you be okay? If I showed pictures of my feet to fun squawking dead, she'd be like, no. First of all, who would want to see your gross feet? Second of all, no. <laughs> gross. Wait, why did, like, when did this come up? <laughs> just, just before we jumped on. We were just relaxing on the couch. <laughs> it was also right after Ryan donated the 400, 400 bucks. Oh. And I was like. Oh, what, what did you, what yeah, did you yeah, show him for that? I wonder, I wonder what will happen. See, what's the cost, Ryan? What's, what's, what do I have to show you? <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> the next episode of Squawking Dead. I'll just add what I said before. After what happened with All Out War and Rick's decision over Negan, like before Rick left, they never really had the chance to like reconcile that or for there to be like a, like to regrow like the mutual respect that they had. So perhaps that's her reason that she doesn't really necessarily think of Rick when she thinks of like the people that have mentored her. And, that, and that's a fair assessment. By the time Rick leaves, it's like, what, year two and a half yeah. into like a 10-year I mean, span. I'm sure that she doesn't actively dislike Rick anymore after all of this time. But it's almost like, you know, Diana was her mentor when she became leader of Hilltop. And then when she left, um, you know, Georgie was her mentor when she was forming uh, Meridian. So it's not that she like, is like, ah, I hate Rick. It's more just like, a, it's, she, he's just not there. He's just not... He's just not the person that she instantly thinks of. Yeah, no, and that makes sense too. There's also a little bit of like, okay, alluding to what I was saying earlier, she makes a decision that Rick in some ways would have made also. Like Rick may has at times dictatorship much, has unilaterally made decisions on behalf of the group, even though he said in the past, oh, it's all of us. We all, we're all making the decision, all of us. It only works if it's all of us, Blah. whatever. So... In that, maybe it's one of those things that we often say on the podcast, you hate in others what you hate in yourself. That's exactly, I mean, that is the point I was going to make, was that the person that she didn't mention was the one that she was being the most like, I didn't learn anything from yeah. him, but I'm being just like him. And I love how that, that almost calls back to their conversation, like, Maggie, you, you could run this thing. I, I'm, I'm going to be looking to you, Maggie. I'm going to be looking to you as a leader soon, until mm -hmm. like he decides to, to take Negan as a, as a prisoner rather than killing him and then they all went to shit after that well technically i mean really it didn't but like emotionally she went shit house. so so i think we're all in agreement like as impressed as we are at, at her making a stand and and kind of respecting the boss move I, I think we can all agree that it was just not a good move i disagree like yeah i it's know not a good i disagree move. with you all 
I think it was. I think. It, I think it was. A, I think it was a smart move. There's this big organized group, and you know they're not going to give us this resources for free. When in she's she's looking at this and thinking, when in life has anything been free? We went to Terminus, supposed to be a sanctuary. We nearly got eaten. Well, I mean, like the saviors. Think, no, uh, that's we, we try to end- Almost getting eaten is enough of an example. Right, right. Like the- <laughs> there's been so many opportunities and- where they, like, someone has been like, yo, here, take this, it's free. And then they get there and they're like, yeah, we want to murder you. Well, but, but to be fair, even on their own, they've almost been eaten. So I... Alexandria has been busted into, and they've almost been eaten several times there too. So no, but it's like almost like I don't, I don't want to trust you because I don't know what you're gonna ask of me. But then also like I do not want to be dependent on you. If we are self sufficient, then we can always be self sufficient. But if we start depending on you now, months down the line, if you suddenly withdraw your help, we we're, we're gonna we're gonna already be dependent on that help. And then what's gonna happen then? And then things are just gonna go back to shit again. It is like you, I don't, I'd I don't rather, disagree. I'd much. rather mm-hmm. I'd rather build this up myself. And I know, like, if I was in the position, I probably would not be like Maggie, and I would probably be like, "Yes, please help me." But you can still you can still respect and you can understand that decision. Oh, and I, I understand where she's coming from, but I feel like all those people, all that she's worried about, that are depending on her, like there are kids and sick people that need care that she cannot provide. I don't want to say I don't care, but if people are going to starve to death under you, then maybe you need to get some help. It's not going to get better. You, how many times are you going to build it up? It's like when Aaron said something to Pamela about, or was it Daryl? We always build it back up. And she's like, it's fallen more than once. Like how many times are you going to get knocked down and try to build back up and start from the bottom before you take some help? And which is what Diane says. Even if, even if it does cost you. And it's not just Maggie, like, what about Herschel and Gracie and, and all the other kids and, and that are they're starving to death? Making them eat horse. Take the help. Yeah. Take the help. You want to leave later? Leave. But I, I feel like they should take the help while it's being offered. I feel like Maggie is making the wrong decision for her people. Maybe it's the right decision Wait. for her, but for the people that she's, she's making, making I the think wrong it's the decision wrong decision for the right reasons. That's ac- I would say that's accurate. Yeah, I don't know about right, but like, yeah, wrong decision for understandable reasons. That that makes sense. Because again, she's saying, yeah, but at least we did it on our own terms. And who can fault her for all of any of us for thinking that, right? But just as we learned in this podcast, like, I can't do it on my own. It's hard, especially if you have bigger plans. If you're going to build something, you have to have people to build it. And if they're all dead from starvation, Starts and stops, what Lydia again. says, right. Right. How, how, how possible is that if we're constantly trying to ward off walkers off from our construction sites? Funnily enough, how she co- um, accuses um, Pamela of being an autocrat, but by the end of the episode, she is the autocrat. She's an autocrat. Because she is making yeah. the decision for everybody. That's exactly like, what maybe I think. At the, what I maybe, yeah. at the start of the, maybe at the start of the episode, you know, where she is like properly considering everyone's opinions, but she does like, make that decision despite everyone kind of being like, yeah, can we, can we take the help? I like how everybody respects her enough, to, for, uh, respects her decision enough to back off, though. I kind of like that. Yeah. It says something about who she is. And it's not like she didn't say anybody, you can't go. You have to stay here. If they wanted to go, she was like, yeah, eh, which, I can't stop you. Which you know? could go be ahead. a foil for the Commonwealth. Because it could be that everybody that just went on, went with the flow can't leave the Commonwealth. It could be. We, we may discover that later on. Whether that stands, we'll find out, but we don't know yet, but... Everybody that seems to be going through the flow. All I'm saying is the Commonwealth has ice cream, so. And electricity. And hot water, showers, yeah. like you got me can there. I ask, can I'm I ask sorry. a question? Out of mm-hmm. everyone here, would they, would they like go to the Commonwealth given the opportunity? Yes. Don't, no hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't Doesn't even, make I'd me any like, weaker. Yeah, bye. I just, I just said hot, hot water and showers and Toilet air conditioning paper. and ice cream. I want to say that I wouldn't, but like the super soft, like, Puss side of me, like probably for sure. Would. <laughs> the Lance Hornsby, the pussy version of Simon, can't forget like, that one. Like oh, I want to say, like principle wise, like I'd be like, no, I want my freedoms, and I don't want a cave, and like we did this on our own, and I want to stick with it, and like I'd like to think that I'm that kind of person, but probably I'm gonna go for ice cream. Mm. <laughs> yeah, like I'm totally like I want to say I'd be have the willpower and I'd be tough, but as soon as they went like. Hey, you can lay in a 
fucking air conditioned room and and eat some ice cream. I'd Peace. be like, no more dealing with walkers. <laughs> Bye, Alexandria. Um, it was nice. Two <laughs> chickens is more we've I... more than we've had in two weeks. <laughs> what? Well, chicken I mean, every right. night for, delivered. For me, I would I'd have to like like be there. Like, what are you gonna like? What role are you gonna give me? Like, if they were like, you know, you're gonna go right back in. What role do you have? <laughs> well, she's gonna be a cushy ass doctor. <laughs> Does yeah, this what the hell, hell? Jasmine? Does this, does, this, does this role include ice cream? Because that's all I'm interested in. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm says not, the doctor. I'm not training I'm not training to be a doctor. Just to I know, but Whatever, you have medical doctor. skills, so you'd be like automatically guaranteed like a decent job, I feel like. Uh, and to caveat that, I, it would very much, for me, it'd be like very much comparing it to like June and Virginia. Like, would I actually be able to help people? Or would I be like, you know, like or would Tony I just even. be, or would I be just being done, like being told what to do and not have, like, because if I have to, Autonomy. if I have to go through something where I was triaging people based on their uh, wealth rather than based on their medical need, then I would refuse to work in that system. Until it became untenable not to work in, in that system. I mean, you'd think... You'd think you'd say that at the time, but then living in a in a world of walkers and I, I don't know. I, I respect your decision now, but I understand what you, what you're where you're coming from. But living, say, in Alexandria, where your chances of helping people survive are very slim as a as a medical person or living in the Commonwealth where you're pretty much guaranteed that when you're trying to save someone, it's going to it's going to happen. Alexandria, you don't have you don't have this that you don't have the resources, clean and rooms the, and, and the, the masks, the supplies. Whereas in the Commonwealth, so like you, oh, I could save people in Alexandria, but you could save more in the but, Commonwealth. You know, so I mean, I, I see where yeah. you're, I see where you're coming but from. I feel but like I feel like there's like another with side June to that in Fia, where she's like she can't she can't save anyone because she keeps getting to them too late under Virginia. But then under Victor, even though she doesn't agree with Victor, she is still able to help people. So it would all depend, like, how, like, what's the system? Am I actually going to help people? Let's call Victor and Virginia the same for the moment because it's hard to quantify. It's hard to quantify what we're talking about when we talk about the deals that we make. But you're illustrating the point. I can see a world in which a, a, a world living under Strand's Tower does have its rules, let's say, and that you are going to compromise your individuality for the sake of the group in whatever fashion, because we don't know, we just don't know with Victor, but I can, it's Victor though. So we can imagine that there is something that's quirky about this arrangement. So you're illustrating the point, like as long as I get to help people, who, what does it matter? So the Commonwealth is that situation for the people in comparison to Alexandria and Hilltop. Like you, they just have the resources. They just have it so that you can actually help people. Whereas yes, in Alexandria, you can help people, but the survival rate with all the nurses, that may not be there. The environment and the 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 operating theater that's not there. Let's say possibly mo more than likely. So yeah, it's all about percentages and survival rates too. What's what's most important to you? Your autonomy or right. saving people as a doctor? Even if the system is broken, am I helping more people than I'm not? Let's just break even here and say I like where we're at, and we'll leave it there for everybody else to decide because it's something to think about as we move forward through this season. Mm -hmm. Because all of this is the turning point. And this is the turning point from the scene that we saw in the, the mid-season premiere of 10B or 11B. This is because the, the show's the jumping ahead six months and Daryl's at the walls and he's saying, nah, it's got to be this way. I'm in a trooper uniform, so it's got to be this way. <laughs> Maggie at the wall. Jumping off of this, I actually just wanted to talk about this one thing. Just like Maggie is not incapable, but refusing to adapt to the way the world is moving, Mercer is kind of coming to the conclusion that even the Commonwealth has to adapt because it's moved in a certain direction since its foundation. Your assigned roles, class divide, troopers as a way out of that lower class, so all that stuff that we talked about in pre previous episodes. But even Merce is coming around to the idea that, wait, these guys valued their autonomy and, and individuality and the, the self that you were meant to be. And, they, and even though they fell over and over again, well, doesn't that just prove that life doesn't have to be perfect or has, doesn't have to be a certain way for all of us to survive? And so in that, maybe the Commonwealth itself has to evolve in order to adapt to changing times. Because when you get set in your ways with this type of system, kind of like you said, Sharon, in previous episodes, when the class keeps dividing and dividing, and th that divide is too apparent, revolution. So even Mars is kind of acknowledging with everything that's gone on with Tyler Davis, seeing Daryl is like, what were you before? It doesn't matter. 
he's like, I'm seeing the cracks form. And if we don't adapt as a community, as, as a commonwealth, I mean, which is kind of a joke, right? Because maybe it's worked until now, but it sure don't feel like a commonwealth. Maggie's moving in this direction was like, you're being stubborn, Maggie. This is the way the world is moving. But like also the commonwealth also is kind of moving in a direction that's like, well, you need to, now you need to adapt. Kind of like the CRM. It made it this far with the military being, being in control. But now the time is to hand the reins to the public has come. So are you going to keep the military occupancy? Ranker is forming at the CRM as well. Silas is infiltrating. The, the kids took them down, t- took the research facility down effectively. I mean, they can build up again, kind of like Alexandria. But this is, you gotta, it does the military, the civic republic military have the best interests of the civic republic now. It's common theme. So it's something to chew on. I mean, that's just history. Civilizations that have lasted adapted. Civilizations that did not last died out quickly. I don't disabuse Pamela in her feeling of wanting, I get it. You want to play it safe, Pamela. I don't disabuse her of the notion of like spreading herself too thin. I, I did kind of feel that, okay, I think we can all agree that Pamela isn't ignorant as much as we thought. She can only control so much, but I think she set herself self up in a position where she's trying to either trying to control too much in her position or doesn't realize how much authority she's given over to Lance in some senses, right? So what, what, what is your impression of Pamela by the end of this episode? Because I know we talked about that a little bit. Charity, let me get your take, though. Whereas we thought maybe she was more ignorant of the go- comings and goings, what, how do you feel about her now? I still don't feel like she's really on top of moving and shaking things around there because Lance is the one that tried to bring them in and Lance is the one... Lance is apparently one the one that orchestrated the whole Stephanie thing, you know? So I, I feel like Lance is really the mover and the shaker behind the scenes. Pamela has her hands in some things, like... I still feel like she's kind of the figurehead because she went to try to convince them and see what was going on. She didn't go because it was her idea. She didn't even want to go. She told Maggie that. I didn't even want to go here. I didn't want to do this. So I feel like she's she's got her fingers in the pies, but they're not deep in the pies. She's she's touching the crust, but basically Lance is the one doing all the actual behind the scenes, the work. I did say that she didn't have any clue what was going on last week, and I don't believe that. I think she does have an idea. She's, she's not into expansion and running things outside or around. She's, she's focused on the internal stuff, keeping the elite happy, planning those kind of things. I don't think she's into the she doesn't want to know part. How the, she doesn't want to know how the sausage is made, essentially. Right. I think she's more involved than we thought, than I thought last week, but I still don't think she's on to- totally on top of everything. Does it make it so that both Pamela and Lance to a certain degree, because Lance, let's assume that from what you're saying, Lance is the the guy that gets things done. But what if the things he's getting done aren't 100% above board? So in some senses, them hand in hand in this system, kind of are, they're not great. Because if what Lance has had to do to get things running, he's had to do some shady things, and she is completely unaware of those things, then it kind of brings what we said last week about who would run it better. Let's talk about the the heroin, okay? I don't think she knows about the heroin fields. I think that's just something Lance is doing on the side. And the opium shows up, and she's like, okay, you got opium. I'm not going to worry about how you did that. That's not something I'm going to worry about. You made it happen. That's all that matters. So when I I say she's, she's dealing with the upper echelon of problems, while Lance is working on the lower echelons of problems, the actual right, problems. Right. And, and we're kind of discovering that that the way he deals with those problems may be the cause of what's going on with this class divide or may have remarkably contributed to the class divide, even though I don't think he's, he intended it to be. I almost don't even blame him because if, if it takes a lot more people in government to facilitate the comings and goings of the, of how the Commonwealth, Commonwealth operates and there's no real structure other than, Hey, Lance, I'm this guy who's making these various deals to get things done at the Commonwealth. It almost feels like maybe you can, nudge me in one way, one direction or the other. It almost feels like there's no like office of, or there, there may be some offices of such and such, but it seems like the thing that really gets the Commonwealth running is Lance, like his little deals with Carol and Carol facil- facilitated both the gala wine and also the heroin that, that was necessary for the hospital. And what if everything that he's ever done and in some ways does break the two class divide, it does to Lance's credit. If you know who to influence it, and if you know who to tap as a resource, you can break the class divide because then you can get what you want. We saw that finally Lance's promise for Zeke's surgery came through. Promise number one fulfilled. You know, you do this and this, 
Here's your surgery. Here's your debt repaid. So I like that. But at the same time, he must have a system of dirty dealings in order to get things done at the Commonwealth, which I'm not saying is wrong, but it's not a system. He is Saul Goodman. He is the Saul the Goodman of the He is Walking Saul Goodman's wet dream. If you think about it, like Saul Goodman would want yeah. this. Like I am part of the system. Not I'm not against the system. I'm what makes things happen. I'm not a, the answer to a broken system. But he's in the system, he's so that, whatever. That, I like that. And he kind of kind of looks like Saul Goodman just a little bit. He's not a criminal lawyer. He's a criminal <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> the suits is what made me make that connection because he wears right. the flashy right. Saul suits. Oh, you know, speaking of outfits, at the beginning of the episode, Lance is wearing a, a tie that resembles a map of the world indicating his his ambitions in in a sense and you can attribute that if you have anything against that let me know but by the end of it he's wearing a gray just a simple gray tie kind of revealing his mood maybe even with like little arrows like darting across little tiny ones barely visible i just thought that was an interesting change in dynamic i'm just thinking about his his jealousy of mercenary like he's the one that's actually making things happen in the commonwealth but he's not getting any of the attention like, everybody loves Mercer. Everybody loves Pamela Milton. But Lance is the one doing the shit. Nobody yeah. cares about Lance. I think it's Lance. safe to agree that, like, we're not... I don't think we're all 100% decided on Lance. I think with some of us, like, Bridget... <laughs> kidding. <laughs> with, like, Bridget, who are like, yeah, he's still kind of wormy. He still kind of skeeves yeah. me out, right? Yeah. He's, he's, he's Saul Goodman. He's, he's Saul Goodman. But, he's... <laughs> but you know, that's the, I'm glad you brought that up. Because we when we watch... Better Call Saul or even Breaking Bad. We, or No, sorry, Better Call Saul. Because in Breaking Bad, we're kind of like not rooting for him. But in Better Call Saul, we kind of are. Mm-hmm. Why aren't we rooting for Lance? I'm rooting for Lance. I am. Who said we're not? Okay. Yeah, who said we're well, not? But, well, okay. <laughs> let, me, let me frame that a little bit better. Why is there an inclination? Right? Because there's still an inclination like, ah, do I? I'm rooting for this guy in that, like, he's not really doing anything wrong. Uh, we felt we were, yeah, Teddy. <laughs> At one point, we're just kind of like, with Teddy, we're like, I'm kind of impressed, right? Even though ultimately, he's like, oh, mother, oh, God, whatever. That whole thing is like, that mother ruined everything <laughs> for me. Like, I was like, okay, Teddy, I, I don't, I'll see where this goes, Teddy. Your community sounds okay. But in, in a similar fashion, okay, what we've seen already so far, we're kind of like, I'll, I'll proceed, Lance, proceed. <laughs> Nobody stop. But there's that always in the back of your mind, they're like, where does the hammer drop? Where does it, where does this, where's the shoe drop? with him i don't know that we're gonna see it or we're ever gonna see it but we're gonna see it trust me it's happening already with eugene why aren't we rooting for lance in some senses like in in a in a full-throated sense like we would saul goodman is he catfish my boy <laughs> well i mean <laughs> <laughs> but even from the start let's say even from the start we have this impression and maybe it's stuck but like what is it slimy in Breaking Bad, when you first meet Saul Goodman and you are exposed to the depths of his sliminess with no balancing of the other side of him, because in Better Call Saul, that's what we get. We get the other side of Saul Goodman, you know, how he became the slimy, skeevy person. But even is he really? Because we don't see him in Breaking Bad other than he's and at work. You know what I'm saying? So we're exposed to the other good side in, in Better Call Saul. Whereas in Lance, with Lance, we're not really seeing anything except smarmy right. skeeviness. And, and what we purport to be his handiwork, meaning how he runs the combo. Should we get a little backstory with Lance and see something good? Maybe that'll change people's perceptions. But right now, all we're getting is the, I'll scratch you back if you scratch mine, slimy, skeevy Lance. That's all, that's all we're getting right now. Maybe to, I think it was Jasmine's point about the coin. Yeah, this is the Commonwealth, this gold-plated thing that looks like gold. But really at the center of it is this this nickel, essentially, this nickel coin. Which is to say, like, yeah, it keeps the thing running. This is what the Commonwealth is, but it's built on it's built on a throne of lies. <laughs> but, to, you know, but it keeps it running. It, which is to say, okay, of course, the Commonwealth at some point has to change. Because our people are involved. I mean, they bring in individuality, self-determination, and self-startership. I'm sure a lot of people have brought that in. What is it? I mean, our group is just good at tearing <laughs> shit down. Like, <laughs> they're just good at destroying everything they touch. So it stands to reason that the Commonwealth is next. <laughs> but but who's to say that it it's you know that that's going to happen again? Well, if lightning can strike four times, fifth time, it's not going to happen this time. Jasmine's struggling right now mm-hmm. for the people who can't see her. <laughs> She's making me mm-hmm. yawn over and over again. <laughs> I'm I'm getting more. I'm sucking her energy out. 
It's like, mmm, your, your tiredness makes me energized. So Ringo might have yawned like 20 times in the last five minutes. Yeah, like you yawn when you talk. It's amazing watching it. It's, stop it. I can't, I, stop talking stop about, stop talking yawn, about yawn, yawning. Yawn, 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 yawn. Do you need to go? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying this. Right, good night. <laughs> good night. Bye, Jasmine. Say good night, Jasmine. Oh, silenced. I need to come clean about the reaction video, who, which you both saw, Sharon D and Bridget. I had a reaction. And this is just, listen, with, with David, I'm speaking to myself in the third person. David ne needs to express the things he needs to express in order to normalize. Sometimes Dave needs to let it out so he can accept it. So when I saw that Maxine's like, you need to apologize, Eugene, I was hurt. I'm like, bitch. You see what this guy just go through in the last episode? But fucking Angela Kang, okay? Angela Kang, she worked her magic and, you know, bless my daughter for who she is. Uh, she managed to, listen, just go with it. <laughs> she managed to bring me around because I get it. Maxine, from her point of view, and I like the way she in which, okay, I have to marvel first that the fact that what they would normally do, this is both on Fear of the Walking Dead and The Walking Dead, what normally happens is, you have this dramatic, horrible, heart-wrenching scene, and Eugene is crushed to a pulp, emotionally speaking, and a little bit physically speaking. He's burning his novel. All of a sudden, Maxine shows up, and I get really angry, okay? What would happen in the next episode normally? The next episode, what would the, what's the first thing you would see in the next episode? Something completely different, right? You, it Just like, oh, we're not going to go back to Eugene, as is normal. But they didn't do that this time. They didn't leave you... But they left you in your anger, or Dave's anger, let's just speak for myself. But they immediately went back and said, guys, we're going to fuck with you some more right now. Because here's, here's all of that from Stephanie's point of view. I like that they didn't choose to cut away from her to, let's say, oh, what's Leah up to? <laughs> Leah Shaw. Remember, she exists now still. <laughs> Months later, who knows what she's been up to? Oh, we didn't catch up with Negan. No, we went straight back to the subject at hand, which is a very, very rare thing on the Walking Dead universe. You are lucky, Angela Kang, or you are smart. You are smart. You, you built your luck. And through the course of the episode, all the way till the end, I came around because they crafted it in a way that made me see Maxine's point of view or Max's point of view. And I appreciated that. For once, I was a tough customer because I'm usually like, I, I'm, I'm usually like Daryl in the Commonwealth. I'll usually go with the flow and wait and see. And like, no, I reacted immediately. I was very angry. I'm like, Paige, what? And so thank you, Angela Kang, for that. Did you guys have similar like feelings in, in terms of that, that, though? Did you initially reject the Maxine's like, I'm hurt. I'm hurt, Eugene. Nope. Okay, so you guys are better people nope. than me? Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> I felt it right away, except, you know, because all, well, I mean, we always thought right. she was in that's, on it. That's, that's a whole yeah, other whole side time, of that. We yeah. thought she was in on it. So when, when we realized that she's not, it's like, and when she came to Eugene at the end, I was like, man, at the end of the previous episode, I was thinking maybe she wasn't in on it. She didn't know. What was the thing that I said right at the end of our last episode? Where were you all this time? Where were you throughout? <laughs> I feel like an asshole. <laughs> Thanks, Angela Kang. You take our jobs. And you make me feel like an asshole. I mean, kudos, kudos. How do you, how do you think that Max knew, like, at that moment, though? That's one of the questions I asked in my notes. How, first of all, how did she know it was Eugene, too? Well, because they never seen each other. Yeah, Have you heard it's Eugene talk? Specific. <laughs> he's, he's, he has a pretty, he has a pretty distinct. Not even um, just verbiage. that, but there was a new group of people that came in, so there would be all sorts of like gossip running around. And yeah, one of them whose name was Eugene. Eugene Porter. The Commonwealth about how like, oh, there's a new group, yeah. you know. They actually have last names, some of them. Because remember, <laughs> May comes out of nowhere and is like, oh, you're from that group? Cool. You must be tough. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so clearly it's being talked about a lot. But I just thought it was interesting that she came at that exact moment, like the lowest moment. I think that their interaction was really heartfelt and I was happy that they got to have that interaction. 
where he kind of apologizes. I felt she was a little harsh on him. I don't think she needed to go that far, but I get she's like spurned because he he went with this other woman. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, she was falling in love with him, and here so, he shows up banging so somebody it. else named Stephanie. She, was, she yeah. doesn't know what we know, too. Yeah, yeah. That's I guess that what we have to appreciate. Bad. But yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. from her yeah. viewpoint. But I'm so glad they did that with the, the camera angles, the different footage. Peering over his shoulder and her shoulder. Yeah, because a... enough time has passed in my watching of that first episode to now. Like, if we're going in terms of, like, watching it when it first airs, there was enough time in between that I went, that's different, I think. Wait, like well, what, it was what enough exactly? for me to What's second different? guess myself and be like, was that how that went the first time? No, it couldn't have I been. I see. Yeah. So you're, so you're, specifically what you're talking about is when Max Max and Eugene meet for the first time. When she's when getting Eugene the is first... Rocky Road. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Because that wasn't clear. I thought you Sorry. were talking about the moment he had the end. Sorry. That's fine. No. Sorry. The moment where they first meet. Yeah. And there's the two different per- right. camera perspectives. You know, her perspective that were shown in this episode and then it was his perspective in the previous or more fly on the wall in the previous one. I appreciated that viewpoint because obviously, yes, obviously we have to say, obviously when they actually first meet, she's so much more smooth max in that moment that, and she probably doesn't even know how smooth she clearly because of the second perspective, her perspective, she felt inside her face heart that, (laughs) that she was hurt and she was, but she, she was like, she always is. She's pretty smooth. Dude, well, lady. the other part of that, though, is that Eugene does mention in this episode that he is not apt at picking up social cues. And so she could have paused. She could have made a face and he could have completely like it's not it. even registered. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. No, that's mm-hmm. pretty kudos. Wow. So you just turned what I had assumed was an objective viewpoint back into a subjective viewpoint from Eugene's perspective at first. Could have been. I mean, doesn't yeah. necessarily mean it is, but he, he goes out of his way to say that he is in, inept at social views. So. Okay. I, I'm, I'm down with that. It's also pretty smart. I, okay. There was one thing I wanted to stupid thing, but it, it appeared as though, and I could not get a good still of it, but she was wearing one of those typical like state shirts that Eugene would normally wear. Like we saw in the last episode, the Kansas City barbecue is the best in the world. Virginia's for lovers, which we have in the blog. She was wearing a similar type of shirt. It looked like it said, keep it cheery, but it had a picture of Africa, I think. I just couldn't get a good enough still to actually say what it was, but it just looked, again, like one of those state slogan-y kind of things that she was wearing. Unfortunately, it's not, no, I did the Googling too. I couldn't find if a shirt like that was sold. I know. Trust me on my Google foo. Okay. It's, it's, it's really good. Sorry. I doubted really, you. I'm sorry. I doubted yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't, it's a waste. It's a waste of time, but cool, cute. And then we got to see a little bit of the back and forth when it came to the manuscript slash novel. They were yeah. so cute. The geekiest love was it in the I've ever seen. Okay, I loved yeah. it. I loved it. That's exactly what I did. The twin brother of the e- sorry, the twin brother of the DA is a, is a scientist. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> that would fool absolutely no one. <laughs> uh, I need Aiden to record himself doing those lines, please. But somebody else has to be the Max character. No, he has to be the Max character. Never mind. <laughs> I, I need him to be both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'll like he'll like get some uh, costume glasses <laughs> to be Maxine. <laughs> and and a flat haired wig because yeah come on Aiden don't let us down <laughs> I mean I was I was like they're giving us these two great ships right at the end of the fucking series like Mersus and Muji Max Jean or you I haven't you, thought about it Max, Max Jean? Jean I like how the wait I like how the character in his book is Stephanie Portman so he's like already he's Portman, already imagining Steph this Stephanie as his wife. <laughs> yeah. So imagine taking on his last name. Mm-hmm. Come on, okay. That, that's that's what got me. That's what. Okay. Oh, that's that's so cute. That's just so cute. Or you know when you do that? What I did? Okay, listen. I did that with my wife when I first met her. Like, oh, Evelyn cameo. Mm. Okay, I admitted this to her later. <laughs> okay, and she loved it. So thank God, because. <laughs> My life is infinitely mm-hmm. better. But yeah, we all, we've all done it, right? Mm-hmm. We've all done it in our lives. I, uh, I hyphenated, so I really fucked that up for my husband. <laughs> yeah, what's, <sighs> what a terrible person. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> okay, let's end the show with you being a bad person. 
Just well, kidding. That's like the third Good time the show already, so don't worry about it. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, there is another bit. What helped was Eugene bringing up to Rosita, I had done the same thing to you. So I'm trying to be like you were with me. That really helped in my watch because it's all about forgiveness. They did not have to uh, keep Eugene around after he had revealed the truth. But the fact that he had this experience of forgiveness, like, oh, I still have value. Like, even though I, I really fucked with my, uh, who effectively were my protectors, they became my friend in spite of the fact that I fucked them. I fucked with them just to keep me alive. And I think that really helped in his scenario. I, and the whole getting on to get on with uh, like Rosita speaking frankly about like, listen, it's, I may not have everything I want, but look, I, I can be with my friends. And he doesn't, and he decides not to tell Rosita. It's like not my story to tell. Like I'm not, it's not my story to tell Max. It's Maxine's story. I, I don't want to out her just like you respected me. And, and when I revealed the truth, I'm not going to out Maxine as someone who wronged me, which told us that like that scene was coming. He also didn't tell her what really happened, though, with... Shira, yeah. Fakeny or Shira. He did not tell her what really happened. Because well, I don't think he wants to ruin so it's, what she has, too, what, what Rosita has. But don't you think that would be a good warning? Like, these people may fuck with you. Like, Perfect. shit is not all it's... Yeah, shit, there, everything is not above I board here. There's something in my else notes going on. says, tell Rosita. Like, just, like, huge. Because... She's in a place to investigate this. Like she would have right. access to places that Eugene wouldn't. So like, and not, I mean, not even just that, but give your friends a heads up that some shit may be going on. Like these people are your friends. You want to keep them safe. You need to say there's some weird shit going on. But here. I think he's acknowledging that if, if he does do that, it may put her in danger. Cause look at, look at the tentacles. I mean, we just talked about it. Look at the tentacles that Lance has that he may not be fully aware of. I think he's acknowledging, I don't know how deep this goes. If they could fuck with me, who knows who they could fuck with? I don't know who I'm dealing with. And so maybe it's best to get on to get on until we can you know, dig around this. Or Because that's a good question to ask. Will Eugene pursue what Lance is up to further? Or will he just leave well enough alone as long as he's building, rebuilding his relationship with Maxine? Yeah, I would think he would feel up. slighted in some way. Like, this guy took time away that I could have had with Maxine and and potentially could have wrecked this relationship if she wasn't willing to forgive me. So, like, I feel like maybe, yeah, maybe the two of them would kind of start to look into it. Because also, they're super vulnerable mm-hmm. in those moments that they had on the radio and to find out that some douchebag was listening some in dude. the whole time. <laughs> I mean, like, I'd be furious. <laughs> But who would be more furious, Maxine or Eugene, let's say? I mean, Eugene's already been burned, let's say, but Maxine. Maxine, I would guess, would be angry. Right, right. I, I would guess, too. I mean, <laughs> given the fact that she said, Eugene, you're an asshole. But anyway, but, anyway. but who's in a better position to find this stuff out? <laughs> Not Rosita. I, but who is? I do want to mention, though, Mercer said that line about, like, being worried. He's like, especially us, is what he says in that. I was like... What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. What is that in reference to? Even her talking to Eugene, coming clean at the beginning, it didn't all, it didn't hundred percent sound like she was talking to Eugene at the time. It was just kind of interesting. I, I, at one point, I'm like writing in my notes. I'm like, who is she talking to? Like, you're explaining things in a way. I mean, obviously, she's talking to us. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Like that whole the voiceover. Yeah, because yeah, it, it, it didn't was sound so like the like, way. Um, it was so the music too. Like it was scored like really like. Oh, Hopefully, it's like a rom com. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was really really um, like fluffy. Kind of like uh, you, the way Eugene was waiting for Stephanie. Uh, yes, with the ice that cream. music had me Not laughing dissimilar. out loud when yeah. it flipped over. Yeah. To that I was like, "What is this shit? Like, this is not The Walking Dead." I also want to note one thing, Max, in her monologue to Eugene. We have to assume, but didn't sound like Eugene. She says, "It never occurred to me that to leave the Commonwealth." Yeah. Something interesting. I thought that was unusual. To say it in that way. And yeah. also, um, that made me think of the fact later in the episode when I did the rewatch, it made me think of the fact that Mercer seems so interested in Alexandria being like successful on their own and like Daryl being like a leader, even though Mercer's kind of like, you were a leader? Like, this, you? this guy? Like, I, he White seems trash like so you? interested what? in it that I was like, <laughs> and he even says like, you're, 
you guys were the lucky ones. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, you're in the Commonwealth. Like, you're lucky. And he's like, it's yeah. not all that it seems. I just was thinking the whole time, I'm like, he's so jealous. Like, he wants that freedom. He wants to have been out doing his own thing, being his own leader, not being told what to do all the time. Or <laughs> maybe let's let's break even and say maybe it never occurred to him that that such a thing was possible in this world. Going back to what we were talking about before, if Eugene has decided... I don't want to put Rosita in the position where she is not going to know what to deal with. And she's in a position where she could be maybe like Mercer harmed in trying to investigate this. So in the break, we, we agreed that Mercer might be, and if he comes around, he might be in the best position to investigate on behalf of Eugene and Max. Do we all agree with that? Maybe. Cause he has like the authority. I mean, supposedly, I, but, I do. But like you said, he says something that alludes that that would be bad for both of us. Well, yeah, he says that line. He's like, this would be bad, especially for us. And I was just like, what? I don't know what that means. I'm not sure what that means for them. Like, like, how did they end up in the Commonwealth? Did they come early on? Or later? Or were they later? And is there some sort of, like, contingency to them being there? Mercer was went to West Point. So there's every reason to think that he mm. was a military officer of some kind, which would just lean lend itself to my theory that everybody there... The Primrose, the star, uh, Primrose started Commonwealth because he could have been part of the military detachment that was mm. there with Pamela when everything went down and, and uh, Primrose was there. So I, my feeling is he's mm. been okay. there since the beginning. Mm. Okay. I was just... So then what is it that he's afraid of in, in exposing or... Well, I mean, I think he's afraid of also maybe being a co-conspirator or being accused of being a co-conspirator. Well, maybe he knows what the hell's going on. Maybe he has... Some awareness. Maybe he knows the shit that's going... Yeah. If he's been there since the beginning, maybe he's involved in whatever the hell is going on and he doesn't want anybody to know. Okay, let's maybe leave that there because it seems like we don't know too much about his his level of involvement. Clearly from the last episode, he is deemed the authority and yet it's being circumvented. So it could be one of two people that may have gotten involved, Pamela or Lance, in Tyler Davis's disappearance. So maybe that freaks him out a little bit too. All this to say, by the way, I think Eugene's decision to not involve Rosita makes sense if he, he if he's even acutely aware this goes deeper than he can possibly fathom as much as i want him to go after it i go back to what lydia says when is the right time to give up you got what you want how much more do you want in a sense like you found the love of your life eugene it, isn't that enough there's going to be a point for everybody on this show to decide we could keep killing each other <laughs> We could keep going after our individuality, but at some point we have to compromise and break even. They haven't figured it out in 12 years. Well, and so this is the final season and we're, we're putting a, a finger on exactly what they're going to have to deal with or die trying, or die trying not to deal with. And I feel like Maggie's on an interesting path where she may decide well, and cue the whole Nag Maggie Negan spinoff series in New York City. So maybe she does die try or not die trying literally, but die trying. And she goes, guess I'm out <laughs> and says, hey, Negan, <laughs> you know what? Shit is so bad. Negan, right. I'm going to hook up right. with Negan and go to what New York. Because everybody's been asking this one. This was announced this week. What would it take? And I think that would be one of those things. Like nobody else is seeing things my way. Enter. Hey, Maggie. Like with his hands crossed. Hey, Maggie. <laughs> it's like, what? what's going on? You were saying, Maggie, <laughs> I'm, I'll be your friend. It's like the genie from Aladdin again. <laughs> you never had a friend like me. <laughs> like Negan. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this show. I love how everybody is playing around with what is luck? What is What does it take to survive? Is it luck? Is it not? Because Maggie's still trying to figure that out. Because if it was luck, where was it when I was out there? Because I had none of it. Okay, I had none of that shit. So I get why she's like, I don't trust this because the minute, minute I get involved, the Commonwealth is going to collapse because that's just the way my lucks run. Okay, so <laughs> I get it. I'm protecting you by not joining you, is what Maggie's saying. <laughs> that thought occurred to me too. Just take a look at my track record. Goodness that's gracious. all I'm saying. I, but that made me feel terrible for her too. I feel her wanting to do this, you know, and against her better judgment. And I'm not saying that's true, what I said before, just before. I'm not saying that's what she thinks. I'm just saying that who's to say is, is what she's thinking. Who's to say that this won't fall just the way everything else falls? I feel, I feel for her. I, I do. Yeah, but Maggie, at least you'd get some sleep before it <laughs> fell. Right. So when is it? 
when is it okay to give up? I, and give it, give it to give Lydia, up, right? Like, you know, as much as we haven't gotten to see her, we got to see her do some things. We got to say her some really key lines. And I like that. I, I like when they make it up to us by having the character say, like even Mercer, the, the few times we got to see him that one episode, sometimes you just got to set, set somebody else up to win. That's what we're trying to do. Or at least that's the spirit of what the Commonwealth is supposed to be. And you see a lot of people carry the spirit of what Alexandria is supposed to be. Aaron, you know, doing his best, trying to convey what the Alexandria was supposed to be, according to the Monroes. Every time it fell, we brought it back up again. You know, who's to say we can't rebuild again? We don't need you as much as you need us, technically. So I don't think they're wrong, but I think that's not the way the world is moving. And I think everybody knows that from Maggie. And I think even, so like, again, going back to the parallel, I think Pamela doesn't know what it takes for the Commonwealth to evolve to where it needs to be, too. We should touch on Zeke a little bit, too, though, shouldn't we? Yeah, probably. It's like kind of just a, just a little bit. This is, this is what we're, where we're going to leave at, because the big question is, does Zeke deserve a little luck? Of course he does. And why? I feel like he does, purely based on the fact that he would refuse that surgery like he was like so close to being like no i'm not doing this like i can't believe you did this on my behalf without talking to me because he wouldn't have done himself you're saying yes and there's that instant where jerry's talking to him and he's you know being sedated before the surgery and he just says no and i was like shit he's gonna say no he's gonna say stop the surgery and then he just says no pineapple which was like totally ridiculous (laughs) (laughs) But I was like, thank God, man, just take the break you're given. Isn't that like an in vino veritas moment too? Like in spite of his ideals, he's like resigning himself to. He may not like it, but he wants to live. Well, he wants, he wants to, he's giving up. When is it okay? When is it okay to give up? I give up. I give up. I want to live. Do it. It, it it does bring to light what Angela King Angela King says in the inside of the episode, which is not something I would have thought of. But then again, I didn't write this shit, so I'm still mad at you, Angela King. But she says Carol is the right person for the Commonwealth right now. She knows how the system works. It's not based on lotteries and troopers escaping that lower class. It's not technically about that. But if you know who to please, Lance, you can make it very far in the Commonwealth. You may live in the same shitty apartment, but you will have all these perks. You will know how the system works. You'll get your surgeries when you need it. Which is, isn't that health before wealth is what you said before the show, Bridget? Yes, I isn't did. Isn't that it? I did health before wealth. And, and which makes Carol super right. Like, even if the system is built the way it is, and even our system the way it's built the way it is, tell me you wouldn't resign yourself to a system that would condemn you to death. Or not, not condemn you to death, but like resign you to death. Wouldn't you as a family member who is trying to advocate on behalf of another family member do whatever it takes to get your wife, husband, child, mother, aunt, uncle, nephew, get them that surgery. You would do whatever it takes. Even if it means you bend some of the rules, even if it means you go above and beyond. So I get where Zeke is coming from. And I think he understands that too. Like sometimes you just have to do whatever is in your power to do for life. Because what is this shit all about? If not to fight for the living, as the fucking banner says, there are things tugging in two directions. Like, okay, yes, Dave, but what's the point of having a system then? What's, what's the point of having rules, even if they aren't, they don't feel fair? I don't know. See, this is why... That's a tough This one. is why I would have a hard time being in the Commonwealth. Like, as much as, like, the perks are great, like, that's the kind of shit that would really bother me. Because I'd rather right. be out there fighting every day just to live and maybe die that way than to die fucking waiting for a surgery because I just don't fall high enough on the hierarchy. However, right, this is the this is going to be the weird part. As much as that does illustrate what Maggie's saying, in a sense, like, okay, we may die, but we die on our feet. But had Zeke not gone to the Commonwealth, that wouldn't even been an option for him. We saw what that was like. Zeke covering up with his bandana, his dumb bandana. Like, oh, I'm a co- I'm a I'm a cowboy now. I, whatever, dude. Come on. You're, you're dying and you're not telling here. anybody. <laughs> yeah, you've got a grapefruit under your neck. What what's going on there? But but had he not gone to the Commonwealth, he would never have had that chance. Also true. He's like the living embodiment of where we need to move. Now, again, when you're on the inside, there is a chance that you can make the changes you need in the right direction. And I think that's that's not why Carol does what she does. She is the answer for for the society as it stands right now. But I think 
she's alluding to, and Angela Kang says as much as inside the episode. She's showing her cards, saying, and that's why, and, and she's right. And, and Carol's right. And he does. We need you. F- yeah. Right. And he does. I'm like, what, Angela Kang? Why are you telling us that Zeke is very important to the growth of the Commonwealth? But, you know, yeah. So there, there's nothing more to say about that, Angela Kang. <laughs> so she may be the answer for the future of the Commonwealth. He may be the impetus for their change, which is to say, is he the one that shoots the the Dwight character? Is <laughs> Or he takes Rick's role and uh, Sebastian kills him, and that's what sends the Commonwealth right, off. Right, after in a being saved. Spiral. That would burn me too. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Let's cut that motherfucker off. Let's, uh, let's cut off his line of credit. Maybe that'll teach him a lesson. Nope, he kills Zeke. <laughs> in bed, no less. After recovering, you're going to be eating jello for a while. Yeah, out of your neck after Sebastian blows your head <laughs> off. Anyway, I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Kari Payton. <laughs> I don't mean that. <laughs> oh, there was one thing I did want to ask about the Mutual Protection Pact. Rachel Ward seems to be a capable leader, uh, at least from appearances. But she says, out of respect for Maggie, we're not joining unless she does. And I thought, as much blame as we want to lay on Maggie for the decisions she makes, isn't Rachel responsible for her community as well? And so why would you just like handcuff yourself, your, com- your own community? to the fate of another's. You have options, Rachel Ward. You're always the one giving people the middle finger when you were a kid. Now you're all about keeping promises and towing the line when you hated these people at first. I'm just kind of confused by that a little bit. The protection pact could work against them in the same way, you know, like in World War I, when Gavrilo Princip assassinated Archduke Ferdinand, the reason it turned into World War I is because there were all these interconnected, you know, if you go to war, then we're gonna come to to defend you and then this other country has to come and defend this and then this other country has to come and defend this so maybe that will be something that happens in the commonwealth if the commonwealth attacks then they have to jump in but then somebody else has to jump in and then somebody else has to jump in and eventually we have all of these communities fighting the crm comes in with their terrible soldiers they bring well, the given, given, given the fact that that oceanside does follow hilltop wouldn't they come in and help hilltop now that the Commonwealth, we've seen the Commonwealth roll up to their gates. The question is how long would, because Oceanside is pretty far away. Like how long would it take Oceanside to come in? And do they get the intel in time for them to roll up before the Commonwealth arrives too? Oceanside is far away enough by car. So by horse and what whatnot, it's going to take a long time. I don't see this as a good pact. <laughs> and yet Milton visited Oceanside like at the same day or the next day. Yeah, we don't have a good sense of time. Or before she went to um, yeah, but I think. Uh, but I think we've all we've all seen in the last couple episodes. The span of time seems to keep moving by a lot. They're they're doing the Game of Thrones thing, where where they could fly from one end of the country to the other in like five hours. But you know, maybe Lance having the different tie also. I mean, even though, of all things, why change just the tie of how many days it's taken? But again, they have cars too. So like a, a trip down from uh, Virginia to Oceanside, Maryland is what I'm going to just assume. Uh, it's not that far, uh, but it's far enough by horse. So I don't know. I don't see this as benefiting people. I think Rachel Ward's an idiot. <laughs> and she's still can young I, too. So. Can I ask, am I nuts? What happened to Cindy? Don't, don't ask those. Don't ask. Stop it with your logic and facts. I just, they panned <laughs> over Rachel and I was like, what is this little twerp doing? Where's Cindy at? Like, She's run, She's the one who signed the to... multi-community charter of rights and freedoms, sure, yes. not Cindy. Yes. So she was fired. Maybe Cindy's off on the fishing <laughs> boat. <laughs> <laughs> also, Pamela Milton had her toes done. That bitch had a pedicure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have nothing to say. Okay, I just thought it was. I thought it was interesting. That's all. What? <laughs> yes, they do. they have nail technicians and good ones because it was a good one. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to say about feet. <laughs> I mean, but you can you can subscribe to our only fit our only stands <laughs> and see only Dave's stands. feet twenty four seven. Check your DMs for stuff between my toes. Would that, would that be only stands? <laughs> only stands. <laughs> I have nothing more to say to that. I just, I feel like Oceanside interlinking their fate with the Hilltop is just a bad look. From a writing perspective, just to set up how influential Maggie was and how she 
had already earned the respect of Pamela in that way. From a writing standpoint, I that's agree. what I felt I like it was. I agree. Yeah. Uh, plus, Maggie's been gone for six years. Why all of a sudden is she allied with fucking Oceanside? She's, she's been gone for six years. I guess because she came in clutch, like, right at the last minute when they needed her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and also, like, who knows what has transpired in the course of three months, at least three months between Oceanside and Hilltop. I don't know. Maybe she helped to repopulate Oceanside. Because suddenly <laughs> there's a bunch of people there. <laughs> people there again. Oh. Or she killed Cindy <laughs> off and that's why Rachel <laughs> She ate. <laughs> Rachel Ward has proven her dominance by eating Cindy. Cindy no, no longer exists. <laughs> She's a pile of bones. Leftovers. Some of the Oceansiders did take residency at, at Alexandria and Hilltop at a point in the Battle of Hilltop and, and all that stuff in the Whisperer War too, which is why it was vacant. Remember, they, they went to the tower and they all fought in the tower and all. So, and Maggie came in the clinch and, and you know, she, her, she saved them. She saved them from the, uh, the Whisperers, essentially, though. So there is that. That's the answer to your question. She saved them in the Whisperer War when they were all held up. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Elijah doing his ninja moves. Negan ultimately saved him in the. And Negan shh, ultimately shh, saved him in the Whisperer War. With your logic, in fact. But Negan's safe. gone. But yeah, but Hashtag Negan's. Negan. Wait, wait, wait. But Negan's been gone since the Reapers <laughs> thing, which is months earlier, right? Maggie's the one who stuck around. So you answer the question again. <laughs> <laughs> Feelings have been shown on Squawking Dead. And with that, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of Squawking Dead. If you like what you heard, head over to ratethispodcast.com slash squawking dead. Five stars and eggplant is all we need to know that you love us. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you didn't like, but tell us after every episode. And if you really, really like what we're doing, head over to ko-fi.com slash squawking dead and just follow us. You don't have to buy us a coffee for 30 days of access to supportive back content. You don't even have to join a membership for as little as a dollar. Follow us. See what you want to jump in on get a feel for what we're doing behind the scenes because we don't post all this stuff on social media unless it's an interview but when you're feeling like you want to be a part of what we're doing here join the chat and react to all the nonsense that we're doing during these recording sessions get the unedited episode recordings and maybe get a few ringtones or a ringtone and some wallpapers or the the access to the unlisted clips playlist or the unlisted live playlist which just contains all the unedited episodes you can jump in tip us for 30 days of access for as little as a dollar you get discord access all the cool things behind the scenes like all the cool kids right bridget yeah <laughs> you're a loser if you don't otherwise already. yeah <laughs> for the best walking dead podcasts out there i there is no one that comes close to what we no, do everyone else shits on it so so we're yeah. gonna listen to this one well maybe maybe that's the solution just in, Dave. we just we just neg them we just, we just we, start oh, shit on it that's a good night. point if you can't beat them join them <laughs> nah <B. laughs> let's, but let's neg our audience in the meantime so that we can it's like the milgram experiments right <laughs> let's maybe we should do what the walking dead with with all of us does with all of us is that we should just neg our audience they, they're more loyal like you guys are worthless Ugh. God, don't buy us a car don't join a membership tier I didn't think you had it in you anyway, <laughs> you worthless pieces of sk You mother pus buckets. Take care, everybody. We'll see you in the next one, which is just going to be tomorrow. And hopefully we'll get both episodes released sometime within the next two weeks. It's good to have them in the can. Early access for all of you behind the scenes. If, if you were lucky enough to have joined a membership tier or bought us a coffee to get 30 days of access, you'll have these episodes a lot earlier than they're going to be released in the public eye. So another advertisement for following us on our journey. Take care. We'll see you in the next one and we'll see you at Fandemic. Until then, bye. Safe journey. Bye. <laughs> Say goodbye, Charity. Blazy. <laughs> Just kidding. I did. <laughs> Jasmine's not here. <laughs> Jasmine's not here. Why? You gotta pick on somebody. <laughs> I pick, I, You're still I here? Pick on Bridget all the, I pick on Bridget Why all the time. It's time to turn the table. Thank you so very much for making it to the end of this episode. We're so happy you joined us on this audio journey. But you should know that this episode was brought to you by our Survivors tier members on ko-fi.com slash squawkingdead. And those people are Survivors tier members, Aliza Jones, 
at lisajones 71 on Instagram, at jasmine.iac on Instagram, ko-fi.com slash fanartlindy, who I just commissioned a piece from. It's a depiction of Morgan Jones in the key art leading up to Fear the Walking Dead Season 6. It's the one where he has his profile visage, uh, and it's just so badass. We just retweeted it on our Twitter account, and uh, we'll probably be unveiling it once we receive it. Uh, it's great. Uh, basically, I, I personally donated some money to her charity uh, run for, it was the Portland Special Olympics, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, I was lucky winner. And so if you have a favorite character you want depicted, uh, you can work with uh, Linda, uh, and you could commission, uh, you could commission her to actually pencil using her brilliant con- colored pencils to depict your favorite character. I highly recommend it. You can support her at ko-fi.com slash squawking dead. Sorry, ko-fi.com slash fan art Lindy, fan art Lindy. That's right. <laughs> uh, and wait, now we have to say the rest of the survivor tier members, which are, uh, Bridget, who was on us in this episode, that's uh, at X Prophecy Girl on Twitter, as well as the man himself, whom we mentioned in this episode for very particular reasons, because he is quite amazing and quite anxiety inducing in terms of his philanthropy to this podcast, at Real Ryan GM on Twitter. Uh, give him a follow. He's a real nice guy, obviously, because <laughs> he supports us. But this episode would not be possible if not for our Whispers tier of members as well. How incredible are they? At Judith.Morton on Instagram, at Aiden underscore Atkin underscore on Instagram, at Tyler Philip Cox on Instagram and Twitter as well his, as his YouTube channel, Let's Talk About the Dead, at Rita's Fan 2 on Instagram and Twitter, at Frosted Angel 67 on Twitter, and Sandy on Facebook. Sandy.D.Morrison. That's two R's. Uh, all amazing people who support the podcast at ko-fi.com slash walking dead. And if you want to follow our journey, just head over there and follow us. You don't have to buy us a coffee. You don't have to buy a, you don't have to join a tier membership for as little as a dollar. Although if you did, you would get 30 days of supporter back content when you do tip us. And if you decide to join a membership tier for as little as a dollar a month, you get a bunch of perks. Uh, in fact, the only difference between the Whispers and Survivors tier members is the shout outs at the end of episodes that uh, one receives when they do join those memberships. The Survivors tier memberships uh, have the ability to join us during these episode breakdowns. And the Whisper tier members get to join us, uh, Whispers and Survivors tier members get to join us in our Jackbox games. Uh, weekly games, although we have been shirking the duties on that one. However, to make it up for both those tiers, we we always offer 50% off our merch store uh, using a special form that we can give you at any time when you join the membership of one of the top two membership tiers, uh, as well as elevated Discord access too. And even the Walkers tier, the base tier, a dollar a month gives you Discord access. So consider joining us or at least following us and then joining in when you feel ready. Uh, I've been your host, David Cameo, and I was joined by Sharon D, a.k.a. Blazy Gardener, uh, Survivors tier members, Bridget, X prophecy girl on Twitter, and Jasmine, at jasmine.iec on Instagram. Thank you so much for making it, and we'll see you in the next one, which we already have in the can. Early access. We recorded both last weekend. So you can already get that at ko-fi.com slash squawking dead. So consider that. Uh, that episode might not be ready for a little while because we'll be at Fandemic. And I hope to see you all there. And uh, make sure, make sure to see us because then we'll ask you the, the all too important question of what The Walking Dead means to you. And you may feature in a compilation video discussing that very topic with a bunch of your friends and uh, fellow TWD family members. Take care. We'll see you soon, hopefully. And uh, get ready some for some pretty big content coming out of Fandemic. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>